All right, we are back here on the Just on Suffering podcast, talking college basketball this afternoon. Joining me today, we are talking college who's the guy who I broke down all March Madness with, the host of the Seeing Red podcast, Troy Moriel is back. Troy, how are you? I'm good, Mike. How are you doing? Pretty good. It's been way too long since we talked college basketball. I'm glad it's finally back. Yeah, it's been a long uh, offseason, very eventful, probably the most eventful offseason in terms of like player movement that we've ever seen. So uh, it's def- we've definitely had a lot to talk about in the offseason, but I'm excited to be talking about actual games now and teams and, you know, conferences and things like that. That That's always preferred over the offseason talk. Oh, for sure. And I mean, one thing that's nice here is obviously we had a very weird pandemic here last year where teams went on pauses. We had something to take the NCAA tournament playing just 13 games, but now it's like we're back on the normal calendar. We got all normal preseason events. Like most of it's back in the right places. So I think it's nice to have all that back. Yeah. If, if college football is any indication as to what we're going to see in college basketball, it, it should be a pretty normal season. I mean, I, I can't remember really any college football games so far this season uh, being affected by by COVID or anything like that. And obviously the stadiums are all full. Um, you know, the rosters are obviously a lot smaller with basketball, but, you know, hopefully we will uh, we will have a pretty normal season with, you know, all of these crazy environments throughout the country, you know, from the East Coast to the West Coast, uh, all at, you know, full attendance, full capacity. Uh, I know I'm excited to get back to Madison Square Garden for for uh, St. John's game. So, yeah, it's, it's you know, it's it's really a welcome sight to uh, to have, you know, kind of the first normal college basketball season and what will end up being like three years almost when you look back uh, to the 2019 season. Yeah, for sure. And let's get started here with some stories you're wa- we're watching here because obviously it feels like there's a lot flowing around here, whether it's Mike, I caught my Chesky's last ride at Duke, the Gonzaga trying to win the title, UCLA bringing back everybody, all the transfers. Like, what are you watching for? What's got your interest early on? Yeah, I'm actually, I actually want to touch on the the transfers a little bit. And, you know, that was just such a crazy offseason, like I mentioned up front, you know, so much player movement, you know, you look at these teams around the country, obviously, you know, there are some, you know, UCLA's and Purdue's that bring back a lot of their starters, but there's also a ton of teams like my St. John's that only have like two or three guys from, from the previous year's teams uh, returning. So, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how all of these teams kind of mesh together uh, at the start of the season when there are just so many moving pieces. I mean, you know, some, you know, programs and schools are more used to that, like the Dukes and the Kentuckys with kind of the one and done era, and maybe some other programs aren't as used to that. So it's going to be kind of interesting to see how everyone adjusts to that. And something else that I'm sure that we'll touch on in a little bit, you know, there in the past, it just felt like there was so much, many more big name college basketball, like fringe prospects uh, entering the NBA draft as guys that, you know, may or may not get drafted, might be like a second round pick, might sign on as a G League uh, League guy. It feels like a lot more of those guys return to school this year. And that's mainly because of all the uh, NIL thing stuff that they can do now. So, I mean, I'm curious to kind of see how that plays out, maybe more so in the future. Like, you know, can these guys, if they have great seasons, make more in college than they would have made, you know, playing in the G League for a year. So, that's something that, you know, in the offseason I noticed as well was there's just so many more guys that felt like coming back to school, uh, you know, because they now can make that money and, and obviously making their teams into, you know, national title or final four type contenders, you know, like UCLA, uh, like Illinois, you know, all, all of those type of, of teams that uh, maybe would have not gotten those guys back in the past. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the transfer thing is wild because look at Kentucky, for example. Kentucky is a team that normally brings in like eight or nine, like top freshmen, five, mm-hmm. five star guys. This doesn't they bring in six transfers and some big names. You got Kellen Gray used to play at Davidson, Oscar Shibwe from West Virginia, Sal- Salvia Wheeler, the guy, he's the assist leader from Georgia last year, came in, CJ Frederick from Iowa. I mean, they loaded on the transfer portal. I think like that's going to be the new recipe for success here because I feel like a lot of them realize, you know, Loading up with a fresh face is not exactly a way of success. Teams experience win. I can go get the experience and they don't have to wait for a year to get them in. Yeah, I think that the, you know, the one and done era is like officially dead. And now we're into kind of the transfer era, right? Where, where you know, every year these, these power five schools are going to be looking towards, you know, the mid majors or towards kind of the low majors or even towards other power five schools uh, for transfers. And that's going to be kind of the new thing, not, not necessarily trying to fit in a lineup of, of four or five freshmen, but maybe four or five transfers, like you just mentioned. So yeah, it's kind of like a shifting of eras in in college basketball that now we're into the, uh, the transfer era. And building the NIL point too. Like one guy I could think of as a perfect example is like EJ Liddell, Ohio state, because he's a good player. He had a good year last year, 
nine times out of 10 in the past prior to NIL, he says, you know, I'm going to jump to the NBA now. I'm not going to get anything from staying in college. Now he can make some sponsorships, get some money, put it in his pocket. He's back at Ohio State and the sport's better for it. Yeah, and especially at a, at a big school like that, you know, when, when you are at a Big Ten, you know, big brand school like Ohio State, you know, you can probably make just as much money, you know, playing one year at Ohio State with all the endorsements that you can make now uh, that you would have made maybe playing in the G League for, for a year. So, yeah, it makes sense. It makes financial sense for these guys to come back. It's, it's been a long time coming that they deserve to make this money off of their, uh, you know, their likeness and, and, you know, advertisements and things like that. So I'm, I'm really happy that we're, we're kind of evolving with the times. Finally, the NCAA is. And we're finally, you know, giving these guys, you know, what they deserve, which is a right to make, you know, money off of themselves and the way that they play on the court. And as a fan, it makes the product much better because now you're, you know, you're not seeing as much turnover. You're maybe seeing more guys play two, three, four years, um, you know, in college, as opposed to all the one and dones like we used to see for the past, you know, basically decade. So, yeah, it's, it's a win-win all around, I would say. Yeah, because the NCAA, I think it's basically Supreme Court forced their hand this, but we got one with the because they lost that case and I had to go to the NIL model. But the NIL model is probably the best thing that could happen in this sport because all your one and done kids, doesn't matter what the rule is, they're gonna go after their one year and go to the NBA. But like your fringe guys who become college stars, like play, staying, they're gonna stay now because they can make money. That's gonna help this sport so much the long term. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, there's so many guys, you know, my school with with Julian Champagny, for example, would have would have been a guy who probably would have been like a second round pick this year. You know, he comes back, he, he's going to make some money off of, off of himself. He's going to, you know, be on a team that has, has you know, uh, NCAA tournament expectations. And then hopefully he plays well enough. And now he's a first round pick next year. And that's just better for everyone. It's better for the kids as well, who, you know, like we said, would have been fringe prospects that can now play themselves into a first round, um, you know, grade in the NBA draft and make, you know, millions more than they would have made. So it's really just a win. It's a win for the fan. It's a win for the, the programs that get these guys back. And it's mostly a win for these guys that they can not only make money in college, but you would think improve their draft draft stock as they get older. And as they, you know, continue playing at a high level in college. Yeah, for sure. Start going down some of these teams and counters of interest here. I start at the top with Gonzaga. Last year, they nearly go on the field. They get blown out by bear in the title game. They have a lot of turnover. There's still a lot of big names there. I mean, Drew Timmy came back. He's probably the favorite national player of the year. Bring in Chet Holmgren, the top prospect in the country. Andrew Nemhart is still there. You turn around, Gonzaga's still number one. I don't know if they're going to go undefeated again, but they're still a major threat. Yeah, I don't know if they're going to go under go undefeated. Um, just looking at this non-conference schedule, for example, uh, they play Texas, they play UCLA, they play Duke, Alabama, Texas Tech. They got a lot of tough games in the in the non-conference, uh, I believe. So, you know, but like you mentioned, I mean, you have the player of the year, essentially, and you have, you know, if not the best freshman coming in, you know, a top two or three freshmen coming in uh, to the country. You know, anytime you have that, you know, you're going to be a nationally relevant team, but the story for Gonzaga is the same as it is every year. You know, their season is essentially November, December, and then March. I mean, you know, January and February, and then early March, uh, when they're in conference play, they're really not going to be tested very much. Uh, I know BYU is going to be a team that that'll probably, you know, give them a test. BYU is always a solid program, but outside of that playing in that conference really isn't going to do much for them. So they need to test themselves in November and in December to get ready for March. Uh, and that's, you know, where their season comes down to. Can they be a Final Four team? Can they get over that hump and win a national title? Um, you know, last year, obviously, they got as close as you can possibly get. Um, and were just beaten by a better team in, in the national title game. Maybe they had an off night as well. So, you know, for Gonzaga, yeah, the, the story of their season is, is really, uh, you know, more so now, like November and December, and then how they play in March, ultimately, in the, in the uh, NCAA tournament. Yeah, for sure. I think also the team, obviously, out West, it feels like weird to say the West is sort of the powerhouse or college basketball is here. You got UCLA out there. They go to the Final Four in that miraculous run last year. And then they bring back pretty much everyone, the big ones coming back being Johnny Juzang, Hami Hawkins, and they add Rutgers transfer, Miles Johnson. They get the five-star wing, Peyton Watson. And also, you could be have another run of glory for UCLA again, which is something we haven't heard in a long time. Yeah, first four to Final Four last year, and then they bring back that entire starting lineup. And like we were just talking about, um, you know, a, a, a guy, Johnny Juzang, who, again, maybe would have been a, a solid NBA draft prospect, but comes back now and is going to lead a team that has final four expectations for UCLA for the first time in a while. Um, you know, anytime you return your, your, your five starters, continuity is great in college basketball. Uh, that's going to be a positive. Like you mentioned, uh, they have they have, you know, uh, a couple a solid recruit coming in as well. 
Uh, I think Miles Johnson's going to be a really good player. I, he's a local guy from Rutgers, um, huge rim protector for them, you know, was a really solid piece to that Rutgers team that was an NCAA tournament team last year. So, yeah, I mean, UCLA, was that run necessarily, you know, sustainable for them last year? Probably not. You know, nine times out of 10, they're probably knocked out sometime before the final four. But when you go to the final four and when you have all that experience and now you bring that entire lineup back, the expectation is going to be, let's go back to the final four. And uh, their preseason ranking reflects that. I think that, you know, this is the highest expectations they've had in a while. So it's, it's going to be fun watching Juzang. Uh, it's going to be nice having another late night team to watch, you know, at those like 10, 11 o'clock starts uh, during the, during the week. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see how UCLA plays this season. Yeah. They always say Pac-12 after dark is a thing for college football. I think college basketball is going to be just as good. Yeah, exactly. We got some good matchups now with the, with the Pac-12. Uh, I'm always a big Pac-12 guy. I'm a night owl. So I like, uh, I like staying up for those Pac-12 basketball games. Uh, last year, the conference was, was, was loaded in my opinion. We had, they had a lot of, they had a couple of really solid teams uh, in, 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 uh, last year. So yeah, it should be fun again this year. They've, they've, uh, you know, got a, got a bunch of decent teams. Yeah. They crushed the NCAA tournament last year. You had four teams in the elite eight. And then you had obviously UCLA make the final four and push Gonzaga at the brink. So I see fun. It's a shame that that matchup couldn't happen in the regular season. They were talking about it for a while. They couldn't agree on a date. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, again, those two could be two teams that match up in the, uh, in the NCAA tournament this year. So, and it would be late in the tournament. So, uh, so we'll see about that. Yeah, I think the other big picture storyline to watch here is that obviously Mike Krzyzewski announced over the summer this is his last year at Duke. They announced story that John Shires to take over the head coach after this year. And seeing what Duke does, Duke last year had a bad year. They missed the tournament, and they had all sorts of things go wrong. Now they got a strong recruiting class again. They have some interesting players come in. They brought in Theo John from Marquette as an impact transfer. So mm -hmm. I think it's fascinating to see what Duke does for Coach K's last ride. Yeah, um, you know, as has been a staple with Duke over the past couple of years, they have that really strong recruiting class come in. They have three top 30 players, I would say. Uh, Paolo Banchero being number one, and then Trevor Keels and A.J. Griffin, the other two. Wendell Moore comes back. And like you mentioned, Theo John, the transfer from Marquette, who I'm very familiar with as a Big East guy, who uh, should be you know a solid rotational player for them as well. Um, Duke doesn't have you know two straight back-to-back -back bad years, I don't think. Uh, that just doesn't seem to happen for a program like that. Uh, I do. I think that they're necessarily a final four team. I'm not quite sold on that. You know, you got to see how these, how these freshmen pan out, but you know, these are three of the, you know, better freshmen that they've had in a while, probably since the Zion RJ Barrett and um, Cam Reddish year. So, you know, Duke is going to be Duke. I think this year, I think that there'll be a, uh, you know, a, a safe team in the top 15 and the top 10 all year. And then we'll see how they, how they play in March. Uh, and it being Coach K's last ride, you know, I'm, I'm really curious to see, like, how much does that kind of, like, dominate the discussion around Duke all season long? You know, is that – is he getting, like, the tributes, like like how we see in the pros, you know, when uh, – like when, when Derek Jeter retires in the Red Sox, you know, or D David Ortiz retired in the Yankees are, like, honoring him. Are we going to see that in, in college basketball? I don't know. Like, are, like is, are, is Coach K going to Chapel Hill and going to get, like, a standing <laughs> ovation, or is he getting booed out of the building still? I'm really curious about that because, like, the, the college rivalries are different than pro rivalries. So I'm, I'm curious to see the reception that he gets in some of these, you know, more heated rivalries. Like I said, like UNC or NC State or, uh, or Virginia, you know, like, like how, does, how does the reaction go with, with those schools? Uh, you know, cause, cause you know, at, at home, obviously it's going to be a love fest and whenever they play a neutral site game, of course, like the champions classic next week is going to be, you know, all about coach cam sure. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm curious to see his reception in some of these more, more heated rivalry spots. Yeah. It'll be fascinating to see. Plus the ACC is pretty good. I mean, you got North Carolina, it looks better. Florida state's always a threat. Virginia, they have a lot of talent that competition have to deal with. Yeah. I, I really like Florida state. Um, maybe the best recruiting class they've ever had uh, this season. Matthew Cleveland's a top 30 kid, I think. Uh, and they got Anthony Polite back as well. A couple solid transfers. So yeah, I, I really like, uh, really like Florida state as kind of maybe like a little bit of a sleeper team to, to win the conference, to be honest with you. And then, you know, North Carolina is, is North Carolina. Um, maybe necessarily like a down year for them last year, but not a great year for them. Uh, they have, um, you know, a couple of uh, solid players coming back and then they get Dawson Garcia, the Marquette transfer and uh, Brady Manick from, from Oklahoma, two really good transfers for them. So I think North Carolina, Duke, um, Florida state are probably like three of your better teams in that conference. Uh, Louisville, I think is going to be pretty good as well. So, you know, we'll, we'll see about, uh, we'll see about the ACC, but 
as always, I think the, the, the domination of the discussion in the ACC is probably going to be Duke and UNC. Yeah, I think let's go to the big conference picture now. Let's go Big 12. And Big 12 has two teams at top five with Kansas and Texas. Starts with Chris Beer moved from Texas Tech to Texas and did a great job loading up all the transfers there. Mm-hmm. Kansas has an elite team. They bring in Remy Martin from Arizona State to be the headliner of it. Mm-hmm. You got teams like the Oklahoma State gang without Kay Cunningham. You have Texas mm-hmm. Tech trying to reload. That's a deep league, as always. It'd be a lot of fun to see how that plays out. Yeah, yeah, maybe the deepest league in, in college basketball, maybe outside of the Big Ten. Um, I, I'm going to start with Texas. I don't think that any school in the country, when you talk about the, you know, the transfer madness that went on with all this player movement, I don't know if any school added as much talent as Texas did uh, this season. You look at three all-conference players, Marcus Carr, Trey Mitchell, and Timmy Allen, um, Marcus Carr averaged almost 20 points at Minnesota last year. They bring in Dylan Dusu from uh, Vanderbilt. And then, as I know, a guy like Christian Bishop from Creighton, who, uh, who you know, has, has was really one of the more underrated players in the Big East last season. You know, that's like five really solid players when you combine them with Andrew Jones. They have a, a, a solid a recruit coming in as well. So Texas, I think, like improved their roster more than anyone did last season. And they were a good team last season, but I think that they improved their roster more than maybe anyone in the country did in terms of the transfer market, like you mentioned, Kansas, Kansas is going to be a top, you know, five team bringing in Remy Martin's huge for them. Uh, they also bring in Coleman lands from, from Iowa state and Joseph Yesifu from Drake. And obviously getting a guy like Agbaji back is really big for them as well. Um, and then the national champions, Baylor, you know, I'm not as high on Baylor as maybe most people are. I think, I think that they just, they have so much talent that they have to, to replace and, you know, they do have a, a solid recruiting class coming in. I believe um, one of their recruits, Langston Love, is out for the year, though. Um, they get James Akinjo on the transfer market from Arizona. But, you know, I, I'm just – when you have to replace that much talent, I'm not sure if I'm as high on Baylor maybe as, as, as other people are, but I still think they'll be a top, uh, top you know, three, four team in the conference and then, and then um, you know, a top 10, 15 team nationally for sure. But yeah, the, the conference, in my opinion, really is going to run through Texas and Kansas this year, as you said. Yeah, those two games will be a lot of fun. I also want to get to the Big Ten. You mentioned probably just as good a conference, you know, not as deep. I think obviously you have yeah. to tease the top with Michigan and Purdue, basically the one A, one B, in my opinion. You got Illinois did well. Maryland did great in the trans marketing, adding Kudus Ahab and Fats Russell. Michigan mm-hmm. State's always a threat. Indiana mm-hmm. with your with your former guy, Mike Woodson, coming in the mix here. That was gonna be a fun mix here. I think. A lot of interesting stuff going on in the Big Ten. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I I think the Big Ten, as you said, it runs through Michigan. You know, Hunter Dickinson coming back. Uh, They get Devontae Jones, who is the the player of the conference player of the year at Coastal Carolina. And that recruiting class is just loaded. Four top 100 guys. I think, you know, two guys in the top 20 or something like that. Um, You know, Juwan Howard has been a fantastic recruiter at Michigan. The conference, in my opinion, is going to run through them. But then, you know, you look, and, and as you mentioned at the top, it's, it's just loaded. Um, Illinois is another team that I think is going to be really good. Kofi Coburn, I know that he's suspended for the first, I think, three games of the year. But uh, he's going to be, in my opinion, a, you know, a candidate for the player of the year nationally this year. Um, and a guy like, um, a guy like um, Andre Corbello is going to be really good as well for them. I think that he's kind of a candidate to leap up and be, you know, a nationally relevant type player for them. Uh, you know, he was, he was solid last year, but I think he can, you know, turn into so, someone who's kind of on the national radar now, uh, Curbelo. And then Purdue, I think Purdue is, is honestly, if I had to pick like a, a sleeper team, quote unquote, I know that they're, you know, nationally ranked and everything like that. Um, if I had to pick like a, like a, a team that I think could, could maybe surprise some people and win the national title or make the final four, I think it's Purdue. I think that they returned so much of that team from last year you know and and again continuity is just so big in college basketball when you return I think it's like six guys that that averaged eight or more points a game last season basically their entire starting lineup um, and they have a couple of solid uh, recruits as well I think Purdue is is you know I don't want to say like a sleeper team because because there are like final four buzz with them but I think that they're a real final four contender this year yeah, I love Purdue. I think they're my pick to win the Big Ten because they basically they bring everybody back. That team was peaked early last year. They came a year early because I thought this year would be their year. They, I think the top three in the Big Ten last year made a tournament, mm-hmm. lost the first round. But mm-hmm. Jay Nivey be a star this year. I mean, Jay Nivey dominated for the USA under nineteen team when he went out for the FIBA World Cup this year in that era, and he's a comeback. He's got. I think he's the Big Ten Player of the Year. That's my personal prediction. Really? Okay, yeah. that's a, that's an interesting pick. I, I would probably pick Coburn, but but I, I I don't disagree with that either. I think that. 
you know, like I think that we agree on Purdue, they're going to be really good this year. And I, I think that, you know, if it's not this year, it's like when they've had some really good teams in the past. Remember uh, Carson Edwards a couple of years ago, they've had some good, some good teams. It always just seems like it kind of falls apart in the tournament for them. Uh, I think this is the year that Purdue is, is a final four caliber team that could, um, you know, not surprise some people, but, but, but make finally reach that final four. Yeah. And I'll also throw out, I think obviously Maryland, I want to watch because obviously that team was so good last year. They had bring in uh-huh. the two impact transfers to be good And Michigan state. I'll point out, they might not have a star tower player anymore. Not Aaron Henry's in the NBA and, mm-hmm. but they are, I think a deeper team. Now they got an impact good recruiting class coming in. They got the Northeastern transfer Tyson Walker at Matt Christie, yeah. five star wing. I think that's team right now. It's just outside the top 25. I will mark this down right now. They're going to be in the top 15 by February. Okay. All right. I, I, I like that as well. And another team that I think is maybe a little underrated right now in the polls, I think is Ohio state. You know, you yeah. talked about EJ Liddell earlier. I think that they're like, yeah, they're 17th in the AP poll right now. I think they're better than that. I think that they're, you know, the big 10 is so loaded. So it's hard to say like, Oh, they're a top, you know, top two, top three team in the conference, but you know, they got EJ Liddell. They got a a transfer from Louisiana, Cedric Russell, who averaged like 17 points a game last year. So I think Ohio state is another team that could maybe sneak into like, you know, a a final four type caliber team. Um, You know, but the big 10, like we said, at the top, between like Michigan, Ohio State, Purdue, Illinois, uh, Michigan State, as you said, there's just there's so much talent at the top of the Big Ten uh, that it's it's just going to be a bloodbath again this year. Yeah, another conference I think is going to be a big bloodbath is your favorite conference, the Big East, where we have obviously Nova brings back pretty much everyone, including Colin Gillespie, who's in the sixth year mm-hmm. after getting the COVID waiver after he tore his ACL last year at the end of the season. You got Xavier, who I think is going to be a big, big force top of the league. UConn. St. John's, we'll say St. John's for a minute. You, uh, Seton Hall, like there's just so much like battle of attrition going on in the Big East this year, I think. Yeah. The, I mean, I think Villanova right now is, is like the clear top team until proven otherwise. Um, but two to like six in the Big East is, is literally just a toss up. I mean, you could put those, those five teams in a hat, shuffle a hat around and pick them out. And, and I'd be okay with any order that you put them in between, uh, my St. John's, Seton Hall, UConn, Xavier, and probably Butler as well. Those five teams, I, I mean, it's it's anyone's guess what order they finish two to six. Uh, I think that the Big East is probably like a five or six bid league this year. Um, you know, and and I, I do think that, like you said, I mean, there's just, there's just so little separation, I think, in like the middle of the pack in the Big East. They also have a team like Creighton who lost its entire starting lineup but has – you know, a really solid recruiting class coming in with, I believe, four top hundred players. So who knows if, if those freshmen are able to, you know, put it all together. Um, you know, you got Shaka Smart at Marquette. So the Big East is going to be deep again this year. Like I said, I think that it can probably put five to six teams in the NCAA tournament. We'll see. It runs through Villanova as as we all, you know, it, it seems to every year. But, you know, St. John's could challenge them. I think Connecticut for sure could challenge them. I, I'm not as high on Connecticut as other people are, but if they put it together, they certainly can. Xavier, I actually am really high on. I know Fremantle is injured, um, but but I think when Xavier's at full strength, they're a really talented team as well. And Seton Hall is always in the mix, you know, at the top half of the Big East. So it's going to be a really, really fun year for the conference. I think, like I said, two to six is just is, is anyone's guess. So it's going to be really, really interesting to see how that plays out throughout a, throughout conference play. Yeah, UConn's fascinating because I think with them, you look at sort of like what, what's happening at Oklahoma State where they lost the one big player mm-hmm. in the NBA where Oklahoma State lost Kate Cunningham. They lost James Book Knight, but the mm-hmm. rest of the group is back. The rest of the group is very good. I mean, you got Adama Sanogo, RJ Cole, very veteran heavy group. I feel like they will, they're not, they can get in and win around. I don't think they're going to be a second weekend team, but they should definitely get there. Yeah. And, and, you know, when they, uh, when they, uh, uh, when they were at without, um, I'm blanking on, on, uh, Okay. A uh, book night last year, last yeah. year when they were without book night last year, you know, they got that experience playing without him. Um, you know, they, they had, you know, a solid couple, couple of games without him, you know, that those guys kind of got to see what it's like. I don't know how much that really carries over one year to the next. And they really were not that good without book night last year. They frankly, you know, they were an NIT team without him last year. So it's curious to see like how much does, does playing without him help? And are those guys able to step up? I don't know if UConn necessarily has like a, a known number one guy right now, like every other, you know, every other one of those kind of top big East schools, in my opinion, that I just mentioned has like one guy who you can say like the team's going to run through him. I don't know if UConn necessarily has that. They have a lot of talented guys, 
but I'm curious to see kind of how that works out for them. Um, and I'm curious to see how they play without book Knight because it did not look very good last year. Now they did get that experience, but I'm curious to see kind of how that transfers over to this year, because it's, it's kind of like boom or bust for them. I think that, you know, their boom is, is really challenging Villanova for the, uh, for the top of the conference. Yeah, absolutely. And let's talk about your team, St. John's, because obviously they made a good push at the end of last year. They could not sustain it. At the Big East tournament fell short of getting to the dance, but they bring back a lot of guys. They had some interesting moves in the transfer portal. What do you think about St. John's prospects this year? Yeah. Um, you know, they, they lose, they lost a lot in the transfer portal. They brought in a lot in the transfer portal. If you look at all of the guys that they lost, I believe they lost seven guys to the portal. Uh, all seven of them transferred down. Not one of them transferred to a uh, power five or power six, you know, however you want to slice it uh, uh, school. So, and, and basically, you know, a bunch of the guys that they bring in, when you look at a guy like Aaron Wheeler uh, from Purdue, when you look at a guy like Montez Mathis from Rutgers, um, Steph Smith from a really solid program in Vermont, Tariq Coburn from a solid program in Hofstra, Joel Soriano, who was uh, one of the better players in his conference at Fordham, you know, they, they, they brought the talent that they brought in. I think it's kind of a general consensus is a lot better than the talent that they lost uh, in the transfer portal. And then the two returning guys are really the, were the two most important guys in the team last year. And that's Julian Champagne, who I think could be the big East player of the year this year, uh, who I think had a real case for it last year as well. And then Posh Alexander, the big East freshman of the year, the big East defensive player of the year, and a guy who has the potential to be a all, all big East player. So you know, when you bring back really the two most important parts of your team last year, they bring in, you know, all these transfers who, in my opinion, are all upgrades over what they lost. Uh, I think that, you know, the NCAA tournament is a realistic goal. I think that, you know, for a program like St. John's, where you're not necessarily, you know, competing for national championships, you know, you want to be in the conversation for a Big East title, you know, for either a regular season or a conference uh, tournament title. And you want to try to win a game in the NCAA tournament. And I think that, you know, this year is really as, as good a shot as they've, as they've had in, in the past, you know, decade at doing that. They've had some good teams over the year that, that have underachieved, but I think that this is, is really in terms of coaching, in terms of depth, in terms of the, you know, star power at the top, maybe the most complete team that they've had uh, since I started watching them, you know, over a decade ago. Yeah, certainly a lot of fun. And it's been a lot of talk about the big boys. Let's talk about some little guys, too, because the mid-majors are probably making fun. We'll take Gonzaga out of the mix. We already talked about them. We know that they're mm-hmm. basically not – they're a mid-major name only. They are a power po- program like everybody else is here. But what's some my majors that you keep your eye on? For me, I got a couple, obviously. I think I'm going to throw out for a few St. Bonaventure. We basically brings mm-hmm. like everybody from last year's team that ranked for the first time since 1971, the preseason poll. They can mm-hmm. win the A-10 very easily. Loyola Chicago won one of those secret scrimmages against Wisconsin. That's his, mm-hmm. like a guy razor. And mm-hmm. I think like the, the pile of the mountain was always a lot of fun too. Yeah. Yeah. And talking about St. Bonaventure, I mean, when you, when you have, I think it was like five double digit scores and they were, you know, you return all of them. Uh, that type of continuity is, is a recipe for success in a, you know, in a smaller conference. I know that they play in the A-10, but you know, in, in kind of a mid major conference or like a, you know, not a power conference necessarily. When you bring back that much, when you have that much continuity, when you have uh, that many seniors on your team as well, like that's a recipe for success, uh, you know, and, and to be, you know, a top 25 type team when you're a mid-major. Like you said, Loyal Chicago, um, you know, their brand has just become, you know, a team that's always kind of hanging around. They're, you know, always a tournament team, it feels like, uh, since they made that run. And, and you know, they're going to be probably, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see them in the top 25 uh, at some point. Uh, I think BYU, I kind of hit on them a little bit as well. You know, they're always around BYU. They're, 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 they're always, you know, kind of in the conversation, you know, as kind of like that, that second team or second tier behind Gonzaga in that conference. So I think BYU as well could be a team that is an NCAA tournament team for sure. And doesn't necessarily challenge Gonzaga, but is like the clear number two team in that conference. Yeah, well, from out there, just a local angle here. I think I always be fascinating to see this year because second year Rick Patino, last year they barely played because they had lots of COVID outbreaks. They make mm-hmm. the tournament, they get they scare the hell out of Alabama in the first round. And then mm-hmm. this year they bring in two I impact transfers in the American. They bring in Elijah Joyner, Tyson Jolly should be playing big minutes for them. They have a lot of guys back. And they put they love a pretty big non-conference schedule. They're playing Alabama. They have a lot of intriguing matchups coming up. They play Seton Hall again. So I think we can see how year two of Iona goes for Patino. 
Yeah, and, and when you talk about Iona in that conference, they're they're always going to be the most talented team in the conference, especially now with, with Patino and the talent that he's been able to bring in in terms of recruiting. Uh, they're going to have the most talented team on the floor, you know, in conference play. Uh, yeah, it's curious to see how they play in the non-conference. They will obviously have a tough non-conference schedule, you know. And for Iona, I think, you know, the goal is is probably to be, you know, a, a solid enough conference champion because you do need to win that conference to get into the tournament. You know, can you be a, a solid enough conference champion to maybe be like a 13 or a 14 seed and not be, you know, a 15 or 16 seed where you're playing a number one or a number two seed uh, in the tournament where you have to play kind of a top 10 team? You know, can Iona, you know, push themselves up enough to maybe that that second tier to where they have, you know, a real legitimate shot at winning an NCAA tournament game as opposed to facing, you know, a one or a two seed like, like you mentioned uh, last year in Alabama. That's it's just going to be, a you know, that they're really mismatched. So. Uh, it's going to be curious to see how the season plays out for them, is for sure. Yeah, let's we'll have a, do a couple of things rapid here. Let's do some sleepers here. You, know, you said you like Purdue as a Final Four sleeper earlier. Mm-hmm. Who else do you have on your sleeper mm-hmm. radar? A couple of teams. So maybe I put more stock into like Ken Palm rankings as as a other more than other people do, I guess. But I got a couple of teams. Florida is one for me. Uh, Florida is 25th in Ken Palm, and they're unranked. And I don't even know if they got votes in the in the AP poll. Uh, I think Florida's got a, a solid team. You know, when you look at, they bring back Colin Castleton, uh, they bring in two transfers that averaged uh, 15 more, 15 or more points per game. So I think Florida is one uh, that, that can be, you know, I don't want to say like a, you know, a final 14, but maybe a sweet 16 team. And I think that they're going to be a top 25 team. And another one, Texas tech, Texas tech is 12th in Ken Palm right now. And they're unranked as well. Um, I, again, I think that Texas tech, they bring back Terrence uh, Shannon, they bring back Kevin McCuller, they bring back Marcus Santos Silva. They lose Chris Beard, their head coach. Um, you look at the transfers that they bring in. They bring in a, a conference player of the year in Davion Warren uh, from Hampton. They bring back Kevin O'Banner, who was big on that Oral Roberts team. So, I mean, that, like those are some solid transfers as well. Uh, I don't I don't get why Texas Tech is not ranked. I, I don't think that they're as good as, as Texas and Kansas and Baylor, but I think that they'll be, you know, a solid team in the Big 12. And, you know, I think that they have a chance to be like a five or a six seed that can make a sweet 16. So I think Texas Tech and Florida are kind of like my two main, main sleeper teams this year. Yeah, I think my I, my two main sleepers, first I'll throw out the fact that I'm fascinated to see how this Memphis experiment goes here with yeah. Penny Hardaway mm-hmm. and see how he does because he got the two big recruits. He got Jalen Duran and Monty Bates and he basically playing, doing the new approach of like player first model. If you read the Sports Illustrated article about his success recruiting at Memphis, we'll see. That translates to on the court. His team won the NIT last year and brought in these two guys. So I think they can make a big jump. But in terms of sl- pure sleepers here, I think I was mentioning the biggie Xavier because people forget this team was 8 0 last year and they were in the polls before they had a massive COVID outbreak. Mm-hmm. They bring back pretty much everyone from that team back for this year. So I think with health, with better luck, with better performance, they're going to be, I think, my favorite number two of the biggies behind Villanova. I think the ACC. Virginia Tech is not getting talked about enough because this team, mm-hmm. like Purdue, was a year early. Bring like everybody here. They also bring in Storm Murphy from Wofford, a big impact grad transfer. Reunited mm-hmm. with Mike Young after they had, went, took Wofford to the tournament and won a game for a couple of years ago. So I think Virginia Tech is going to be top three in the ACC. That's my personal projection. Yeah, I, I like them as, as well. I really like what Virginia Tech is building out there uh, as well. And, and what you said about Xavier, you know, I, I do think Xavier is is – Maybe I, I would probably pick them like third, to be honest, in, in the Big East. Um, but I, I could see them challenge. They're another team that I could see that, uh, challenging Villanova in the Big East. They won't have Zach Fremantle for a while. But, you know, when Big East play starts, you would assume that he's healthy. And uh, if they're healthy, I think, yeah, they have a top top two or top three team in the Big East for sure. They they underachieved last year. I don't think that there's there's any way around it, um, not making the tournament. But you know, Xavier's another program that that doesn't go that long without making the tournament. They haven't made the tournament in a couple of years now, so uh, we'll see how they play. One more team I want to just throw out there is Rutgers. Uh, I think Rutgers, you know, they get back Ron Harper and they get back Geo Baker. Those are like their two best players, I would say. Uh, you know, they didn't do a ton on the transfer market, but what Steve Peichel's uh, built out there, you know, they're not going to be a – I don't think that they'll be, you know, a, like a sweet 16 type team, but I could see them being ranked at some point, you know, the big 10, like we said, it, it's such a gauntlet. So they're going to have so many opportunities for big wins. Um, I could see them, you know, kind of being on level with what they were last year. No one's really talking about them. Um, you know, their, their metrics and everything are not that high. I think that they're only like a, what are they in the Ken Palm, like 60 something. So they're really yeah. not that high. They're not getting a whole lot of love, but 
I think Rutgers can be a tournament team again and a team that maybe advances in the tournament and, and is kind of like on level with what they were last year. Yeah, for sure. Let's wrap it up here. We were got you playing teams. Now I'll tell you some games to watch because I feel like the most underappreciated like sporting calendar in all in all sports is the non-conference play of college basketball games because it falls right in the peak of the, of the holiday season. You have the NFL getting down the stretch. You have the NBA starting. I will don't check out a lot of these non-conference games. So give me some of your favorite non-conference events that you think people should look at. Yeah, sometimes it's overwhelming, right? There's there's so much to watch around this time <laughs> yep. of year that you kind of, yeah, for some people, college basketball kind of gets uh, forgotten about. Uh, you know, everyone is going to love the Champions Classic that obviously kicks off the year with those four programs, Duke, Kentucky, Kansas, Michigan State. You know, all four are going to be, or all four are ranked. All four are going to be in the, you know, national conversation this year. But how about the uh, the Hall of Fame tip off in uh, in Mohegan Sun? This is in uh, November. Look at the, the the four teams that you got in this. You've got Villanova, Tennessee, who we didn't talk about, but I think Tennessee is another kind of sleeper. You know, maybe top you know Sweet Sixteen type team. North Carolina, who's always there, and then Purdue, who we both like as as one of the best teams in the Big Ten. Those are four really really good teams. Four teams that have, in my opinion, like legit Final Four hopes. Uh, maybe some more than others, but I think all four of those teams, it wouldn't stun me to see any of them in the final four at the end of the year, uh, all in one tournament in, in Connecticut. I might, I might have to make the drive and go to that turn that uh, hall of fame tip off because it's at Mohegan sun. So not that far of a drive um, though. That's a really, really solid tournament in my opinion. Yeah. I mean, that's a bracket too, which means they're going to get multiple games. Yep. These teams. So that's going to be a lot of fun to see how that yeah. plays out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I yeah think exactly. Who, who knows the matchups that you're going to get. Uh, yeah, you're, you're, you're essentially getting what four really solid team games. If they, I'm assuming they play a consolation as well. That's four really good games over, over a two day stretch. Yeah, absolutely. And I also um, throw out there, I mentioned the CBS sports classic out in Vegas in December mm -hmm. is a lot of fun. You got UCLA, North Carolina, Kentucky, Ohio state. Those are, that's a hell of a field, not a bracket, but those are two great games. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's always a, a fun one. Those, those teams. And, uh, you know, like we said, those are all, all teams that, that have, you know, maybe now final four hopes again, you know, UCLA, as we said, is going to be one of the top teams in the, in the country. So yeah, that one will be very fun as well. And I think that one's a little bit later in like December. So that's, that's a little bit better. Cause it's, it's kind of like separated from maybe the, uh, the main ones that you see around Thanksgiving time. Yeah. It's Saturday before Christmas, that one. Yeah. Uh, and which, which is a lot better. Cause I feel like, you know, you're, you're kind of like, it's not as overwhelming at that point when there's like a million of these, of these, uh, of these uh, MTEs or whatever they call them. There's a little bit less of those. So it, I think that might get a little more attention maybe. Yeah. So I want to issue a fact correction on my part earlier. We said Gonzaga and UCLA do not play. They are actually going to play in uh, Vegas on November 23rd in the good Sam empire classics. That's going to be. Oh, a okay. Game. oh, okay. Yeah. I didn't even, I didn't even see that. Um, oh yeah. I got it right here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Gonzaga. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, that'll be, I mean, that's right now the top two teams in the, in the, in the nation. We'll see. Yeah. But those are two teams again, would that shock me to, if that's the, the uh, you know, national title game, you know, three or four months from now or five months from now? Absolutely not. So, yeah, that that's going to be a really fun matchup in a couple of weeks. Yeah, two more I'll throw out. These are, all, these are both around Thanksgiving weekend. The battle for Atlantis, you got a pretty deep bracket field there. You got Michigan State, Loyola, Chicago, Auburn, UConn, Syracuse, VCU, Baylor, and Arizona State. It's a lot of heavy hitters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one that, one that kind of disappoints me as well, just, just looking at this. The, the Maui Invitational, it's it's not in Maui, it's in Vegas. And the, the field is just not what you would normally expect from the Maui. Maybe like, I, I mean, when we were growing up and, and, and you know, in the, in the past couple of, of years, it feels like the Maui was like the tournament that everyone wanted to go to. You look at the bracket this year, it's what, Texas A&M, Wisconsin, Butler, Houston, Oregon, and Chaminade's always in it, St. Mary's and Notre Dame. Not a, not a very, you know, like deep, field whatsoever not a whole lot of matchups that i'm really that interested in to be honest i'm a little disappointed in the maui this year well i think to be fair i think that's also a big difference in going to vegas and going to hawaii i think it might yeah. be the one where it's like okay you know like well, Teams we'll, are, we'll, it? Yeah. We'll, go, we'll go next year we can actually yeah. go to hawaii <laughs> yeah, yeah so hopefully they can bounce back next year with, with a big field yeah the last one i'll throw out is also around the, like, the espn events invitational down in orlando and i know it's top heavy because you have kansas alabama in there but there are a lot of talented mid-major programs in that event. Iona's playing Alabama, the opener. They get the rematch yeah. title game. Belmont and Drake, two high-quality mids. North mm -hmm. Texas made the tournament. Dayton is good. And yeah. if you're looking for potential bracket buzzers, that's the event you want to keep your eye on. 
Yeah, uh huh, and and I believe Belmont is another team that that everyone is is really high on this year. I don't know much about them, but I know that they got votes in the in the top twenty five. So yeah, that that should be another uh, good tournament for sure. Yeah, so basically, in between your turkey and Thanksgiving weekend, make sure you look for a lot of these tournaments where a lot of them tend to pop up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, don't don't just you know forget about college basketball in, in November. I know a lot of people tend to to only get into college basketball in like February and March, but if you watch it in November, you will certainly be surprised with how uh, entertaining the product is. You know, you don't need to be a super fan to to get into college basketball in November. No, that's the one thing I can't say. I thought he was like, oh, I'll turn into college after the Super Bowl's over, and then like they, yeah. they miss everything. Yeah, exactly. There's so many fun matchups in in the non-conference play. And then, I mean, like, what you know, I'm not a huge NBA guy, but I guess a lot more people are interested in the NBA in, like, December and January. But uh, personally, I mean, yeah, I, the, the the style of basketball and college basketball is, is way more fun uh, to me. And it's just a more intriguing product. And it's it's what I watch 24-7, basically, from, uh, from November to March. So I'm looking forward to it again this year. All right, there you have it, Troy. Thanks all the time. I really appreciate it. Before I let you go, we follow social media, keep up with your St. John's podcast, the Seeing Red Pad. I saw your seeing your season preview podcast just dropped. Yeah, yeah. You can uh, follow me on Twitter at Troy Moriello. Uh, that's Troy M A U R I E L L O is the last name. Uh, yeah, I do the the Seeing Red podcast, cover St. John's basketball. Uh, we just did our our season preview yesterday, or, or it was dropped this morning uh, with Zach Braziller of the New York Post. So. Yeah, like we said, should be a fun season for the Johnnies. Should be a, a tournament season. Hopefully, you know, they, they can win a game in the tournament. Hopefully, they can challenge for the Big East title. So come along for the ride if you're a St. John's fan or if you're a Big East fan, and we're going to do a podcast every week on them. So really looking forward to that. Absolutely. Troy, thanks for all the time. I really appreciate it. Definitely. Thanks, Mike.